Hey, welcome to Westbridge Church. My name is Jeremiah. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's great to have you with us. I want to say hello to those of you joining us online. Thanks for joining us there. And if you're in a parent viewing room, that's a great option. If you have small children you prefer to keep with you during the service. Um, It got a little warm in here. So if you're like, man, when does the hot yoga begin? Uh, I just want to let you know that we're working on that. Uh, We'll get that adjusted here momentarily. But um, man, this is so cool because we partnered with Water4 in the last year. And uh, Water4 is a organization that determined we're not only going to bring access to clean drinking water to communities that don't have it, we're going to provide it through a different means and we've, they have a different model than what we've uh, seen in the past. They actually hire someone locally who's a part of that community that can build and own that well. So a lot of things that have happened in the past with wells is uh, these big organizations and they do great work and they do great things, but they come in, they build a well and within 10 years it's in disrepair and nobody's there to fix it. And so uh, it's estimated that up to 60% of new wells that are dug within 10 years, they just get closed up. And uh, what these guys do is they actually go in and they hire someone from the community to build and own that well. And so they they are the ones who own it. They're repairing it. They're fixing it. And not only is it a well where people come and gather water, they're actually running pipes to people's homes. And then there at the center uh, where the well is, they are actually doing small groups, uh, discipleship groups that are walking people through the story of Jesus, the living water. And so it's just a really cool model that we got to partner with this year. And because of your generosity as a church, we were able to, as well, Westbridge Church, uh, for about $30,000, we were able to fund one of these uh, stations in that community that he's at right now. And so that's a, uh, we just wanted to show that to you and say, this isn't like, we're not pitching you going, hey, can you give towards this? We just want you to know because of your generosity, this is what you've given to. These are, these are some of the projects that you've been a part of because you're such a generous church. And so thanks for uh, taking what God has given to you and returning that as a part of your worship. Uh, we're doing everything we can to steward that and manage that well and then uh, use that as a, as a way to make an impact locally and around the world. So we appreciate your generosity. Uh, right after service, if we've never met before, uh, if you've been coming for a few weeks, if you've been coming for, if today's your first time, uh, if you've been coming for a couple years and we've never met, if you have, uh, you just want to learn more about the church, five in five is the place to be. Right down here, right after service, five things about Westbridge Church in five minutes or less. Beautiful. Okay, we are in week three of a series called The New You. The new you. And the whole point of this series is we're walking through this letter that the Apostle Paul wrote in the first century to a church, a group of people in the city of Ephesus. And so these people are called Ephesians because they live in Ephesus. So if you've ever wondered, like, what is this book of Ephesians? It's a letter Paul wrote to the Ephesians. And a, a big theme of this is that God is making you new. He, he is, he's creating you to be a brand new person. He's done some things to make you new. And so the whole first half of this sort of letter is very vertical. It's everything God has done to move in your direction. It's the idea, especially in the, in the early world is uh, in the first century was that uh, these are the things I have to do to get to God. And so the whole message of Jesus is here's everything God has done to move toward you. And so in the very beginning of this letter, we've read this uh, the first couple of weeks. We're going to read it again today. This is what Paul says uh, about what God has done for us as he moves in our direction. He writes this in the very opening of the letter, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. And so this is this idea where Paul says, God has moved in your direction. It's very, very vertical. And through the first, what we have uh, really is a letter. So when Paul originally uh, sort of dictated this and wrote this, it wasn't, um, it wasn't, chapter and verse. It was just a letter all the way through. We have the benefit of being able to have chapter and verse that we can kind of reference things. And so the first three chapters are just very, very vertical. Here's all that God has done for you. And then as he moves towards the second half of this letter, it's very horizontal. Now, here's how you ought to live as a result. And so as we look at the past couple of weeks, if you've missed any of these weeks, I'd encourage you to check them out. But man, the first week we just said this, past, present, and future. Here's what God's done. In the past, he chose us. In the present, he adopted us. And then he promises that one day all things will be as they should be. And then last week we looked at chapter two where Paul talks about God's grace. And he says, man, we haven't just been saved by grace, but we're supposed to live by grace. 
Like there's this gap between who I am and God. And, and what fills in that gap is grace. But there's also this gap between who I am today and, and who God's creating me to be. And it's not just about trying harder and getting stuck in a cycle. It's about letting grace fill that as well. And so I'm, Paul, Paul would say in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, he would say, this is what you're saved uh, from, and then this is what you're saved by, and then this is what you're saved for. I have a mission for you now to accomplish. And so today, as we, uh, we're going to look at this next section that Paul writes in this letter. We're going to dive through a few things, and he's just finished describing all that God has done to move in our direction. He's finished describing how God's grace is making us new. And then he begins this next sort of section of verses. And here's what Paul writes. It's a group of people in Ephesus. They're reading this, and he says, Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. And so he, he's writing this and he says, let me remind you, you're a group of people. Now, uh, again, this is very first century type of thinking. The, the Jewish people had a, this agreement with God. They were the ones that were chosen to bear God's name. And they felt like anybody who was outside of that, they were not fit. They didn't have access to God. They didn't belong. And so Paul says, let, rem, let me just remind you, you were considered ungodly. You were considered unclean. You were considered less than. You were considered the outcast, the outsiders. And you can see how Jewish people have used this word throughout history to make sure that anyone who wasn't a part of that, wasn't circumcised, uh, they would call that out. And so uh, there's a story in the Hebrew scriptures, a guy named Samson. Uh, it, maybe you've heard the story of Samson, maybe you haven't, but he's a strong leader in the, uh, in the Hebrew scriptures. And at one point, he goes and gets a bride from another uh, part of the world and brings her home. And this is his parents' response. They say, you chose a bride from the uncircumcised? Of all the places that you would go and choose a bride, that's who you brought home. In fact, there's another story. You're probably familiar with this. And uh, even if you didn't grow up around church, you've probably heard this story because almost every year, it's, it happens during my favorite time of year, my favorite holiday. It's not Christmas. It's called March Madness. And uh, every year during this time, there's a 16 seed facing a one seed, or sometimes it's like a 14 seed facing a three seed. And, and every year, some commentator on some, you know, on ESPN will say something like this. It's David versus Goliath here today, folks. And we all know what that means. But that actually comes from a story in the Hebrew scriptures where a shepherd named David kills a giant named Goliath. The odds were stacked against David. And yet, if you read that story, here's what David says. He shows up to the camp, and there's this giant named Goliath, and he's taunting the armies of, of uh, Israel. And here's what David says. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that is daring to taunt the armies of the living God? There is something for uh, first century Jewish people, there's something for people in the Hebrew scriptures that just said, this is, this is how God marked us. This is how, and so we've just decided anybody who doesn't have this is on the outs. And Paul says to the Gentiles, do you remember what it was like to be left out? Do you remember what it was like to be less than? Uh, to think that God wasn't for you? To think that God hasn't chosen you? Do you remember what that was like? Do you, do you remember that feeling? Circumcision was this sign in the Hebrew scriptures that God had given to Abraham. And it was a way for God to say, through your descendants, I'm going to bless the entire earth. I'm going to bless the whole world through your descendants. And this is just a sign. This is a symbol that's going to mark that promise. And unfortunately, over the years, in the minds of the Hebrew people, it became a divider for those who have God and those who don't have God. And as Jesus comes onto the scene, and now Paul is writing in the first century, there's this very, very clear line of demarcation. It is a div it's a divider. And unfortunately, this is just kind of human nature. Anytime a group of people think God is exclusively for them, it will lead them to exclude other people in the name of God. Hey, God's just for us. So we, we got to help God out. So we have to exclude other people because God's for us. He's, he's, he's team us not team them. And unfortunately, this still happens in churches today. 
<laughs> it's why we're constantly reminding ourselves here at Westbridge of this language that we use very intentionally. Come as you are. No perfect people allowed. Uh, it's why we use this language all the time. Like, even if you don't believe everything we believe, you can belong. There's a place for you here. Because we never want to communicate that there's an in and there's an out. And, and you have to fit certain things or you got to change things about yourself in order to come to Jesus. Because that's never the message that you find in the scriptures. And so Paul takes his readers on this remembering journey. He says, don't forget, at one point, you were considered unclean. You were the unwanted. You were the outsiders. And then he kind of walks them through what that means very practically in their lives. He says, this is what it was like. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. You lived in this world without God, and without hope. Now, when I think about my life, I've been a, a follower of Jesus for about as long as I can remember. I grew up and my, my dad was a pastor and my grandpa was a pastor and my great grandpa was a pastor. And, uh, like, uh, this is like a family business at this point, okay? And I grew up and in, in, in I'm really grateful for that upbringing. I'm really grateful that growing up, I knew that God loved me and God created me and I could trust him with my life. But uh, I just... Sometimes you can be, if you've been following Jesus for a long time, and maybe this is for some of you, it can be really easy to lose sight of what life could be like apart from Jesus. What my life could be, what path I could have gone down, what life could look like apart from Jesus. And if we're not careful, we can get to a place in our own minds where we start to feel a little bit entitled. Like we're kind of like, yeah, I mean, I mean I've, done, I've done some stuff. God owes me. And Paul wants to remind us where we've come from so that we never, ever feel that we've somehow earned it. He says, look, what you've done, what you've done does not determine who you are. But when you recognize who you are, that should determine what you do. When you know who you are, when you know who you belong to, then you know how to live. And so he's just finished telling his readers in, in Ephesians chapter 2 that God's grace is this free gift. No one can earn it. No one can boast about it. He really wants to make sure that sinks in. And he says, and if you remember who you were before you started following Jesus, and he breaks it down. He goes, do you remember? You were, you were separated from Christ. You were without Christ. That means you were without salvation. You were without a savior. It's only God's grace that brought you into relationship with God. Without that, you were on your own. The best you could ever do in this life is whatever you could do for yourself. And you couldn't even keep your own standards, let alone God's. And you were separated from Christ. Paul would say this to his first century readers, and it applies to us. Before we met Jesus, we were separated from Christ. And then he would say this, as a matter of fact, you were excluded from God's family. You weren't even a part of God's people. He says you, you were foreigners. You were strangers. You were not citizens along with the nation of Israel. It was, it was them and everybody else. And you were excluded at that point. Do you remember what that was like before Jesus entered your life? Paul says you were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel. That had a specific meaning because God had chosen the nation of Israel to, be, uh, to, to bear his name during a specific season in history. And over time, there would be a new Israel. Paul would say now there's a new Israel which would come to describe anyone who would bear the name of Jesus. But Paul is reminding them before Jesus, they didn't have a group to belong to. They were stateless. They were without a family of God to belong to. And because of that, they actually had no knowledge of God's promises. None whatsoever. They had no knowledge of God's promises, no idea what was going on as a part of that. And there's promises that God had made to the nation of Israel. They were a theocracy, meaning their theology, their, their worship of God, their religion, and their government was one entity. So this theocracy was this relationship with God that God would protect their nation, God would lead their nation, but God was bringing that forward in human history to a point where he would eventually say, now there's going to be a new Israel, everybody is invited in. And Paul would say, up to this point, the Gentiles were excluded from that covenant promise and from that kingdom. And then Paul would say this. Eventually, he'd say, you know what? You are without God and without hope. Because of this, because you didn't have a savior and because you couldn't identify with God's people, you didn't understand the covenant promise that God made that he would bless the whole earth. So you were without God and ultimately you were just without hope. Is there any more hopeless of a word than hopeless? I mean, if you've been a Vikings fan for any length of time, you... <laughs> You know what that means. 
Hey, I'm a, I'm a huge Vikings fan. Okay, the struggle is real. Let me just tell you. And I can tell you this. One of the privileges and pains that I've experienced in life, doing what I do, being in the position that I'm in, is walking alongside families who have lost loved ones. And I can tell you, it's in those moments that I'm reminded more than ever that we are a people who have a promise and we are a people who have great hope. I can tell you that. Because I've sat in a memorial service and heard family members speak about their loved ones with tears in their eyes because they're going to miss them so much in this life. But at the very same time, so much hope in their voice. Because when you're a part of the family of God, there is no such thing as goodbye. There is only see you soon. That's an incredible thing. I can't imagine how people make it through this life without that promise and without that hope. And Paul says, do you remember? Do you remember that? Do you remember when hopelessness marked your life? It was hopeless. You were without God. Therefore, you were without hope. Oh, you had plenty of gods. You had plenty of temples. You had plenty of places to go and worship. But none of them offered you the hope of eternal life that this God offers. And so he's taking them through a chapter and a half. And he's just reminding them. May I remind you that God sought you out first? May I remind you that God rescued you from your past? May I remind you that there is nothing that you could have done to earn this on your own? May I remind you what life was like before you experienced the grace of Jesus? And if you've been a follower of Jesus for any length of time, can I just invite you to soak that in? Just to soak that in, to think about, man, what life could be like if it wasn't for Jesus, if it wasn't for citizenship in his kingdom, if it wasn't for his promises, if it wasn't for the hope that he offers, where would my life be? And so you can remember how amazing God's grace has been in your life. That is who you were, Paul would say. Let's remember who you were, but now let's recognize what God has done. And so he starts the next verse and he says this, but now, that, that was before. Recognize, remember who you were, but now recognize what God has done. Now you've been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He, there, there's all these commands and regulations. These are the things that people did to try to get to God. And he says, it's not about me trying to get to God. Now it's all what God has done to get to me. He says he made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross. And our hostility toward each other was put to death. He brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who are far away from him and peace to the Jews who were near. And now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. Like, I get it. Perfect. Let's close in prayer. So much going on there, right? Let's unpack that. Paul is writing to a group of Gentiles who have always been excluded. They've always been excluded. They've always been on the outside looking in as far as it relates to the God of the Jewish people. And God is now inviting them in, including them, and to fully understand how significant this is, you have to look at something that happened to Paul after he left Ephesus and went back to Jerusalem. If you want some fun reading this week, I would encourage you to read Acts. Now, Acts is not A-X. That would be so awesome, but it's not. It's A-C-T-S. It's short for actions. This book is called The Actions of the Apostles, or it, it describes what happened in the first century to the early church. It's more of a narrative. It's not a letter that someone wrote. It's actually a narrative describing here's what happened. And so uh, Luke is the guy who writes it, and he travels with Paul. And he describes what was happening. And so I would encourage you to read uh, uh, it, Acts chapter uh, 20, uh, 21, and 22. These three chapters this week. It's a fascinating story. And this is where uh, Paul leaves Ephesus. He says goodbye to his friends at Ephesus, realizing he's probably never going to see them again. And he travels back to Jerusalem. And when he goes to Jerusalem, he's, he brings a guy from Ephesus with him. One of his friends travels with him. His name is Trophimus. And Trophimus is there in the city of Jerusalem, and they're hanging out. Now, the Jewish people really hate Paul, even though he's a Jewish man. 
The reason they hate him is because he's traveling around the Roman Empire and he's letting the outsiders in on this God thing. He's going to all these Gentiles and going, hey, come on in. Hey, God came for you. You don't have, God's grace is for you. And they're going, whoa, 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 time out. We're the chosen people. You, you can't be doing this, Paul. And they immediately stir up the crowd against Paul. They grab Paul and they say, men of Israel, this is the guy who preaches against our ways and he preaches against our temple and he preaches against these things and he even defiles the temple by bringing in Gentiles. You're like, so what? What's the big deal, right? See, they had seen Paul with Trophimus earlier in the day walking around the city of Jerusalem, and now they saw Paul in the temple, and they just assumed that he had brought Trophimus in with him. He hadn't, but they just assumed. And the temple is the most segregated place on earth. In the very center, you have the Holy of Holies. This is the place where the Ark of the Covenant is. Now, if you're like, what is the Ark of the Covenant? Think, this is the thing Indiana Jones was going after in the first movie, okay? <laughs> Raiders of the Lost Ark. This is it, all right? And then they find it, they take the lid off, and then the Nazis' faces melt off, right? So that's it. It represents, the, this is the place where God's presence dwelt. It, it would have held, that box would have held the original stone tablets of the Ten Commandments. It would have held a couple of other artifacts, and, and they put this in the very center of the temple, and, and, and they said, this is where God lives. It's in this chamber called the Holy of Holies. And a priest was the only one allowed to enter that chamber, and only once a year. So you can imagine how holy that place is. And then on the, just past that, there's another court, and it's called the, the, the Court of the Priests. And only the priests were allowed to enter that court. And then beyond that, you had the Court of the Jews. And only Jewish men were allowed into that area. And just beyond that, you had the Court of Women. And only Jewish women were allowed to enter that area. Now, outside of that, you have this this wall, this is the wall of the Gentiles, okay? This wall goes all the way around the entire compound. It's about five feet high. And every few feet, there is a plaque that reads, any Gentile who crosses this wall will be personally accountable for their own death on this day. That's, that's more than no trespassing, right? That's like, <laughs> hey, it's not trespassing. Trespassers will be prosecuted, right? It's trespassers will be executed. I mean, think about this. This is the climate into which Paul arrives in Jerusalem. And their thinking is, he brought a Gentile into the court of the Jews. He brought a Gentile into the temple. And there's this huge riot, and it says all of Jerusalem is in an uproar. And they grab Paul, and they start to beat him right there in the temple courts. <laughs> How's that for a church service, right? I know sometimes our lobby gets crowded and you've had some thoughts, but you probably like, <laughs> nobody's beat anybody that I know of. And the Roman guard heard that the city of Jerusalem is in an uproar and the guards come down and they, everybody stops beating Paul. They're like, they're afraid of the Romans. And so they grab Paul, they start to carry him away. And then Paul addresses the Roman officer in Greek. And he says, hey, I'd like to address the crowd. And the guy's like, oh, I didn't realize you were an educated man. And he goes, I thought you were some revolutionary that started these uprisings in different parts of the... So he lets him speak. And if you read the story, it says that the, he addresses them in, their, in, in Aramaic. And, and so he starts to speak to them. And the entire place, the city goes silent. They're listening to him. And he says, fellow Jews, I, I understand why you're upset. I used to be in your shoes. I was a devout Pharisee. I... I, I Put, uh, I followed followers of the way of Jesus and I put them to death. I, I arrested them. I traveled around and, and I wanted to end this thing called the way of Jesus. But one day I was traveling on the road to Damascus and I was blinded by this light and Jesus revealed himself to me. And so now I've committed myself to sharing this good news with people everywhere. In fact, Jesus has sent me to share the good news of his grace with the Gentiles. As soon as he said Gentiles... The place lost it. And so they, they go into riot mode again. And now, just to save Paul, the, the Roman guard have to grab him. They're taking him back uh, to their fortress. And the whole time, the city is behind him screaming, kill him, kill him, kill him. And they're chanting, kill him, kill him, kill him, kill him. So the commander uh, brings him inside. And, and they're like trying to figure out what to do with Paul. And so the commander of the Roman legion says, uh, orders Paul to be whipped. 
and to d- demand to tell him, what have you done that's causing such a riot? So they, they strip him and they're about to whip him. And Paul says, is it lawful to whip a Roman citizen without a trial? Guard drops his whip, right? It's like, whoa, hold on. You're a Roman citizen? Because it would have been certain death for any soldier that whips a Roman citizen without a trial. So he goes to his commander. He says, this guy's a Roman citizen. And so instead of whipping him, they actually keep him under house arrest. They ship him off to jail. And while he's in prison, he finds himself in Rome. He's in prison. And now he writes this letter back to the people in Ephesus. Several years have passed. And he's thinking about his friends in Ephesus. He already said goodbye. He knew he'd probably never see them again. But now he's in prison. He's writing to his friends in Ephesus. And he wants them to understand. He wants them to understand exactly what God has done. He says, remember who you were? Remember what life was like without Jesus? You were without salvation. You were without a savior. Remember how you weren't even a part of God's people? Remember how you didn't understand the covenant promise and and you were without hope? But now you've been brought near. Now, let's read these verses again with all that context in mind. Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separates us. For people in the first century, this wasn't just a metaphor. This was a wall that they had experienced. Trophimus had traveled to Jerusalem with Paul, and he stood outside the wall of the Gentiles, the wall that said, you're not allowed. God is for us. He's not for you. And now Paul is writing to them just a few years later from prison, and he's saying, look, that wall that says you can, you can come to God and you can't, God is for you, but he's not for you. The wall, that one that I was beaten for, the wall that I was arrested for, that wall is gone. It doesn't exist. There is now no wall that says, you've done this, and you've done that, and you've been here, and you've been there, so you're not allowed in. Paul says, there's no wall. This is your skin color. This is your politics. This is your language. These are your parents. This is your addiction. This is your sexuality. There is no wall because of what Christ has done. That dividing wall has been destroyed. And then he continues. He says, he did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. The whole idea was that we would, Jewish people would go past the wall of the Gentiles and we had access, but we'd still have to abide by certain things in order to somehow get to God. He goes, but that's done away with. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. And together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross. And our hostility toward each other was put to death. He brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him and peace to the Jews who were near. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. Paul says, remember who you were, but never forget what God has done. Remember who you were, but never forget God has destroyed that. He's completely and forever done away with anything that previously separated you from God. And he didn't just turn Gentiles into Jews. It wasn't like, oh, okay, you can join the Jews now. He took the Gentiles and he took the Jews and he made an other, a whole new category. And it's no longer us and them. It's just us. We no longer identify as Jew or Gentile because God is creating something entirely brand new and you get to be a part of it. Here's what God is doing. God has created one new community. The two groups have become one. God has created a new community and it's completely made up of all the new yous. So Paul says, here's what God's done. He chose you, he adopted you, he's forgiven you. You remember what life was like before that, but now you're invited in. And then guess what? He did that for them. He did it for them. He did it for them. He did it for them. And now he's invited all the new yous into one big new community that you all get to be a part of. One new family, one new society, and you're not kept out by any walls, and there is no hostility that divides us, and there is no hostility between us. This is why you and I can walk into this building on any given weekend with all of our differences, with all of our different political views, with all of our different worldviews, with all of our different personalities, with all of our different upbringings, with all of our different socioeconomic status, with all of our different ideas and ways that we see the world. And we can love each other well because there is no wall of hostility. 
We can know with all of our baggage, with all of our questions, you can come in with no matter what you've done, no matter where you've come from, no matter what struggles you have, there is a place for you here because the wall of hostility that separated us has been torn down. It doesn't exist. You do not have to be on the outside looking in. God is building a family and he wants you in it. That's an incredible message. And Paul has driven this point home and now he shifts his focus to the implications for us today. And it's almost like he talks in these cycles where he just keeps repeating himself but in different ways to really drive the point home. It's like, hey, remember, this is who you used to be, but now here's what God has done and now here's the result. And he just got done doing that last week, right? Hey, this is what you were saved from, life before grace, and then grace entered your life and now this is what your life is like after grace. And he just keeps driving this point home. Remember who you used to be, Recognize what God has done. Now, realize who you are now as a result. And Paul's going to use a few different metaphors. The first one is this. We're citizens of God's kingdom. He would say this. You're not strangers. You're not foreigners. In the past, you were, you were kind of referred to as the uncircumcised heathens. But now, you're invited in. God's kingdom is not a specific place where you can go. It's not like the magic kingdom. Uh, it, it, God's kingdom is a way of living and being in the world. It's an allegiance to a king who is not of this world. It's living out the law of love that governs his kingdom. It's recognizing his loving lordship and trusting him enough to live the way he asks us to live. And so Paul would write to this group of people and he would say this. So now, remember, remember who you were before Jesus. But now, here's what God has done. So now, you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners, you are citizens along with all of God's holy people. Remember how they used to tell you that you were on the outside? Remember how they used to tell you that you, know, you, were, you were other, that you were less than, that you were the outcast and the outsider and you were on the fringe? He goes, no, no, no. Now you are citizens of God's kingdom. God is making the new you. He sent Jesus into this world on your behalf and he is making you new through his grace. But he's also making a whole bunch of other new yous. And all the new yous function together as citizens of one kingdom. It's one new uh, community. It's one new society. And here's the great news. Paul would say, no longer are you operating on a work visa. You have a birth certificate. You aren't foreigners and strangers who happen to be in this kingdom. No, no, you are home. We are citizens of one new kingdom that God has invited us to be a part of. And then he says it's even better than that. He would continue and say, but also we're members of God's family. Not only are you citizens of this new kingdom, but he takes it to a whole nother level of intimacy. And so he would say this in the next verse. He would say, so now you're Gentiles. You Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You're citizens along with all of God's holy people. You're members of God's family. This is the whole next level. The metaphor becomes even more intimate. A citizen of a kingdom is one thing, but a, but a family member is something else entirely. And he would say, and in Christ, both Jews and Gentiles find themselves more than simply fellow citizens under his rule, under his loving lordship. You actually find yourselves brothers and sisters as a part of the same family. And through these verses, Paul is using multiple metaphors to make his point. He would say, man, it's like... It's like you've become citizens of this new kingdom. He'd say, no, no, it's even better than that. It's like you've become brothers and sisters as part of the same family. And then he uses another metaphor. He says, in fact, you have become God's living temple. And this is even more intimate because it means not only are we citizens of God's kingdom, not only are we members of God's family, but we're actually the place where God lives, that God dwells, his spirit lives in each and every one of us. Now, Paul would continue in these next verses and say this, together we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We're carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord and through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. What does that mean? Paul takes something they're familiar with, building and temples, and he compares this new kingdom and this new 
this new family specifically to a building, specifically to a temple. And in masonry construction, this, the cornerstone would be what they would place first. And whatever direction that cornerstone was set, that's what determined that, that the rest of the building would be square. That, that's what set the plumb line for the whole rest of the building, for the whole rest of the foundation. Paul says Jesus is the cornerstone. He gets set first, determines how everything else is laid out. And then from there, these, the, the first century apostles and those eyewitness accounts, they, they build this foundation that's set by Jesus. And then he says, man, and then every single one of you are another stone that's being laid on top of that foundation, and you're building this beautiful temple. And a temple is something that they would have been very familiar with. Uh, the temple in Jerusalem had been part of the identity of the nation of Israel for centuries. In fact, it was first built by Solomon. And Solomon's temple was just absolutely beautiful and just incredible grandeur. And then it was destroyed when they were defeated in battle and carried into captivity. And then uh, several decades later, it was rebuilt by a guy named Zerubbabel. And if you're uh, considering baby names, I would strongly <laughs> add that to your list. Baby Z. And then from there, Herod the Great, who lived in Jesus' day, had rebuilt the temple in a magnificent way. And so the temple was something everybody understood. It was something Jewish people understood. It was also something that the Romans and the Greeks understood because they had all kinds of different temples to all of their gods and all of their deities. And the Apostle Paul would come along and he would say, man, Jesus wasn't just adding Gentiles into an already designed Jewish system. He was doing something brand new. The old temple was exclusively for Jewish people. As far as the temple in Jerusalem, but... What could be the center of unity for this new community that God was building, right? This new community wasn't a new nation. It's a whole brand new humanity, and it's international, and it's worldwide. And a geographically localized center would not be appropriate for what God was doing, for the brand new community, the brand new society that God was building. So this new temple, it would serve the same purpose as the old temple. It would be where God would live. But Paul is introducing them to this brand new concept. God would no longer dwell in a temple made with human hands. God would live in the people who belong to his new society, both individually and as a community. Can you imagine how this might have stirred them up in the first century? As they're reading this, uh, Paul is writing this to people in Ephesus, and as they're reading this, the incredible temple to Artemis still stands in Ephesus. In fact, the, the temple in Ephesus to Artemis is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was magnificent, an incredible temple. And you have that standing in Ephesus, and you also have standing in Jerusalem, the Jewish temple built by Herod the Great, barricading itself against the Gentiles. And Paul writes, and as he writes, you have two temples, a pagan temple and a Jewish temple, and both of them are designed to be a dwelling place for their respective gods, and both of them are empty of the living God. And as Paul writes, he says, we recognize the wall of hostility has been broken down. We have become citizens of a new society, members of a new family, and God's spirit promises to live in us. Paul would say, you and I are the living, breathing, walking temple of God. And so he's reflecting on this. He'd say, this building, this box that we build here, this brick and mortar, this isn't the temple. You and I are the temple. And he's reflecting on this, and he's thinking about the unique role that he's had in being, being able to bring this message to Gentiles, to people who are far away from God. And as he's thinking about it, and he, for us, it's what we would call chapter three of Ephesians. He, he thinks about this, and he recognizes, man, God is up to something. In fact, this is what we can take away from this today. We have been rescued for a purpose. There's a point to all of this, and it's not just for ourselves. Remember who you were before, without a Savior, and without a family, and without God's promises, and without hope, and then recognize what God has done. He's removed the wall of hostility between us and God, between us and each other. Now everybody is invited, and everybody gets in the same way. And realize who we are now, citizens of God's kingdom, members of God's family, God's living temple, breathing, walking, living temple where God's spirit lives. And that's why we gather. That's why you and I are here. Because when we get together in this imperfect community, in this 
you know, brick and mortar box that we built a few years ago. We're here with an imperfect community of people who used to be without Christ and used to be without hope, but we have been invited into something bigger than ourselves and not just for ourselves, but for a purpose. Paul would say, here's the purpose. God's purpose in all of this. So he's reflecting on everything he's written up to this point, everything we've covered over the last three weeks. He goes, God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus our Lord. The goal, Paul says, is God wants to use this new temple, not not a building, this new temple being you and me, this new group of people, this new community, this new society, that collectively we would display his wisdom, that we would display his love and his grace to the world around us. That when people walk into this place on any given weekend, they'd go, I don't understand. How is it that you and you and you and you and you, like if I put the five of you together, there should be a lot of hostility. Because you think this way and you see things this way. Why is it that there's no hostility between you? Well, because the wall of hostility has been torn down. When Jesus died, he put to death the hostility that was between us. And now we love really well, even when and especially when we don't see eye to eye on everything in this world. Paul says that was God's plan, that the church would display and reflect the wisdom of God to the world around us. So now when we come together, no matter what differences we have, the one thing that we have in common is the grace of Jesus. And we can reflect that into our community. There are so many things that could divide us, but the wall of hostility that keeps us the other has been torn down because of Jesus. Now here's what we are. Citizens of God's kingdom, members of God's family, the living, breathing, walking temple of God. And when we love each other well, it is a display of the love and grace of God to the community around us. I want to close with this prayer. This is a prayer that Paul prayed in the end of Ephesians chapter 3, what we know as chapter 3. This is the prayer that he prayed for the Ephesians. And I want to pray this prayer for our church today. And then, uh, if you've never said yes to following Jesus, here's the message. The wall of hostility has been torn down. There's no wall that you have to get past in order to come to faith in Jesus. The invitation's extended to you. And if you've never said yes to that, I wanna invite you to do that. Here's the prayer that Paul prayed, and I wanna pray it for our church today. When I think of all this, Paul says, I fall to my knees and I pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, He will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. God, there are those of us here today who would say this, please forgive my sins. I, I, I don't want to be without Christ and without hope. Thank you for moving in my direction. Thank you for adopting me into your family. I say yes to that invitation. Help me to follow you. Help me to trust you as best as I know how from this moment on. And God, for the rest of us, we recognize there are so many things that could come between us. There are so many things that, could, that we could call the wall of hostility. But when Jesus died and rose again, he also put to death this wall of hostility that separates those who are out and those who are in and that tore down the hostility between us. And so, God, we ask, may our lives as a community, as this new community, this new society, as you're making each and every one of us new, may we collectively be the living, breathing, walking temple where your spirit lives. And may this group of people committed to following you, God, may we reflect your love and your grace to our community. We thank you. We pray this in your name. Amen.